Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. This is Talking History, my name's Liz and before we get any further into the video I want to apologise for my very croaky voice and if I start sniffling and coughing my lovely husband decided to share his cold with me. So I took last week off, had a little break over Easter. I did work some of it but no actually work work and not you know but um no, I enjoyed the little break and I hope you all had a lovely Easter break too, whether you're still off for the Easter holidays and not back until next week, whatever you did, I hope you enjoyed it, whether you celebrate Easter for what it is or whether you just enjoyed the chocolate. Either way, I hope you had a lovely time. So this week we are back into the swing of things. We are diving straight in to um, the story of William Cleto. Now, William Cleto, he um, actually, he was a player during the anarchy, but he also had a legitimate claim to the throne of England. And if you want to find out a bit more about William Cleto, then please do stay tuned. <laughs> William Cleto was born in October 1101 and he was born to Robert Curthose, who was the eldest son of William the Conqueror. His mother was Sibella of Confessano, daughter of Geoffrey of Brindisi, uh, Count of Confessano. I hope I pronounced all of that right. I really apologise if I haven't. Now, William Cleto, he was signified as a man of royal blood or prince. So when William's father, Robert Curthose, was captured at the Battle of Tichenbray by his younger brother, the now King Henry I of England, in September 1106, Robert was returned to England, where he was imprisoned at Device's castle for 20 years before being moved on to Cardiff. So Henry placed the young William into the care of Helias, I hope I pronounced that right, Count of Arcus, I think that might be right, even though I really want to say Argos, but it's not. <laughs> and he was married to Robert's illegitimate daughter. Now, unfortunately, history has neglected to record her name. So William remained in the care of his half-sister until Henry demanded that William be handed over to him in August 1110. Now, Helias' household didn't do this. Instead, they concealed the young boy and they smuggled him off to their master, who they both then fled the Duchy of Normandy. So William found refuge with the Norman magnate Robert de Bellamy and Robert had extensive estates in the south of the Duchy and he was also enemies with Henry I. Now, um, de Bellamy was captured in 1112, so then William, who was accompanied by Helias, seeked refuge at the court of the young Count Baldwin VII of Flanders, who was also William's cousin. So in 1118, a powerful collision of Norman counts and barons had allied themselves with Count Baldwin and they rose in rebellion against Henry um, in William's cause and they seized much of the um, of Normandy but Count Baldwin was seriously injured in the siege and this was in September 11, 1118 which he eventually died from his injuries and this led to the collapse of the rebellion. Now, William's cause, now when I say William's cause and William's case, what I mean by that is after William the Conqueror died, it was um, William Rufus was um, his successor and that was what William the Conqueror wanted. So when William Rufus was killed during uh, a hunting accident, or so-called accident, well, depends what you want to think of that, and then Henry I, he saw the perfect opportunity and he seized the crown for himself. Now, if Robert Curthose was in England, whereas at this time he wasn't, he was 
in Jerusalem fighting the First Crusade. If he was in England, technically it would have gone to him because he was, even though he was the eldest, it didn't the um the Duchy of Normandy went to him and then William Rufus had the throne of England. So it would have gone to Robert Curthose. But because he wasn't in England and Henry saw the perfect opportunity, he took the throne of England. Therefore, if it hadn't gone to Robert Curthose, it should have gone to his son, William, as he would have been the next in line. That's what I mean when I say his cause and his case, because they believed that it should have been William Cleto. So, <coughs> <coughs> sorry. So William's cause was then taken up by King Louis IV of France and the following year King Louis launched an invasion of Normandy down the river Seine. I'm never sure how to pronounce that. And Louis was met by King Henry at the um, in battle on the 20th of August in 1119 at Wemuel. The result, it was a decisive victory for Henry. Now, William Cleto, who was around 17, he had ridden as a new knight amongst King Louis's guard in the battle, and he had barely managed to escape. Now, the next day, it was reported that Henry's son, William the Adlin, had sent William the horse that he had lost in the battle as a kind of a, a, a family gesture, kind of, well, cousins really, sort of, you know. So the rebellion collapsed shortly after, but William continued to find support at the French court. Now, King Louis, he approached the Pope with William's case in October 1119 and forced Henry to justify his treatment to the exiled boy. <clears throat> Excuse me. So on the 25th of November 1120, King Henry's the first only legitimate son and heir, William the Adlin, died in the White Ship disaster. Now, the tragedy completely transformed William Cleto's fortunes. William Cleto was the only surviving male heir in the line of William the Conqueror. Now, many Norman magnates adopted William's case. So William the Adlin, he had been betrothed to Matilda of Anjou, who was only nine years old. Now she wasn't in, she wasn't on the white ship. Um, so her father, Falk V of Ca the Count of Anjou, asked Henry to return her dowry, which included castles and lands, but Henry refused. So Count Falk then betrothed his other daughter, Sibylla, to William Cleto and gave him Sibylla's dowry, the county of Maine, an area between Anjou and Normandy. Now Henry, not being best pleased about that, he appealed to the Pope and he had the marriage annulled in 1124, stating that they were too closely related. So the Normans once arose once again against Henry in 1123 to 1124. And that's how it continued for King Louis, taking any opportunity he could find to add to Henry's discomfort by providing men and money for William. Now, in 1127, it was around the same time that William married the French Queen's half-sister, Joan of Mont Montferrat. Now, Louis, he was just using William just to have any dig he could at Henry. So, William was becoming a real threat to Henry. 
he had a legitimate bloodline to the throne and then suddenly in 1128 all of that was about to change on the 12th of july 1128 william was at the siege of aast i'm really not sure how to pronounce that and william was wounded in the arm and you think what's good no it's just a wound in the arm but the wound became gangrene, gangrious, gangrene, gangrious. And William Cleto unfortunately died on the 28th of July, aged only 27. William's brother-in-law, Helias, had been by William's side for most of his life and he remained one of his biggest supporters. Sadly, there's no portrait of William or even any description of him. His uncle, Henry, the, um, the first, uh, he was, he made a major rebel out of him and he made sure that William didn't inherit either Normandy or England after the death of his own son, William. William Cleto's father, Robert Curthose, he survived his son by five and a half years and that is William Cleto's story a short video for today though so just try and get back into the swing of things and help my poor voice <laughs> so anyway I hope you enjoyed the video and please do continue subscribing and liking and sharing and doing everything because you're all blinking amazing and I can't thank you enough so do keep on supporting and I will keep on recording all these videos because I just love it. So anyway, until next time, I don't know how to win the video now. <laughs> so until next time, look after yourselves and I'll see you all soon. Bye.